Bueno, muy buenas eh, tardes ya. Eh, antes que nada, aprovecho a todos para este eh, siguiente Brownback eh, Seminar. Eh, tenemos el gusto y el honor de presentar al doctor Alfonso Larqué Saavedra. Muchos de ustedes, por supuesto, eh, lo conocen, no es una figura desconocida. Eh, el doctor trabaja en el CICI en eh, Yucatán. Tiene un eh, grado de Biología de la UNAM, eh, un posgrado de Corpus y un doctorado de la Universidad de Londres. Es autor de más de 130 artículos científicos, 23 eh, capítulos de libro y, importante, eh, tiene tres eh, patentes a su nombre. El doctor Larqué ha estado colaborando con el equipo de CIMIT, que está trabajando en el proyecto de eh, modernización, o de, perdón, de Milpa Sustentable y con el equipo que trabaja con Masagro en eh, la península de Yucatán. Y debo decir, personalmente, siempre eh, me ha encantado poder escuchar sus, sus consejos, sus nuevas ideas y lo que queremos es también que este eh, Brownback Seminar sería el inicio de, eh, una, de, al, de poder poner en, en acción algunas de estas visiones y ideas, más de lo que ya eh, hemos hecho, doctor. Como último, por supuesto, es ganador reconocido con el premio a la sustentabilidad de Cargill Simit este año 2016. Un aplauso para el doctor, por favor. thankful to see it and to Brown for this great opportunity of presenting to you what we are after trying to see how can we help in this crusade against hunger. Uh, do you want me to go in English or you want me to speak in Spanish, Brown? What's the idea then? It's, uh, it's all right. Well, anyway. Well, first of all, uh, let me tell you that uh, the central question which uh, I have is precisely why do we include seeds from the trees of the tropical rainforest? And always I keep in mind how to produce food without destruction or destructing the environment. One of the really problems I have in my mind is precisely to know that Mexico is importing daily about 40,000 tons of grain. That is absolutely a dependence of imports from any other country, though. So we are importing about 90% of the rice, 38% of maize, and about 46% of wheat. So I am embarrassed to mention this through to you, but that's why I brought for you the, our proposal. Beside that, we know about this millennium uh, goals that everybody knows, and the idea of having, keeping in mind the climatic change. Moreover, we have in front this situation in which the population increase is going to be one of the greatest challenges for the food production system. So, but just let me tell you where do I come from now, where I am located. I am in Yucatan, in this part of the country, though, and in that place we set up something which we call it genomic bank in which we were very much engaged 
of trying to save the great biodiversity that we have in the tropical area of this country. So many scientists are pushing this project and we have two main collections. We have co uh, collection, alive collections, living collections, and we have, as you have here, seed collections. In our living collection of edible species, we have more than 20 different species alive that everybody can see, where we can appreciate that we haven't really worked out the great value of these plants that are consumed by the Maya people. Beside that, we have a special location for the seeds of the uh, Mirpa, this agricultural system, in which we have, for instance, 205 entries of Faciolus lunatus. Or we have 313 entries of Siamai, of three of the main races of maize we have in the peninsula, Naltel, Sibakal, Jmehenal. So the entries we have there, which are the collecting uh, work of our colleagues, are somehow very important. But beside that, we have a very rich collection, I should say the richest collection, of uh, medicinal plants which are more than 68 plant species from 31 botanical uh, families. We have as well collections that uh, are important trees for the construction of housing, etc., etc. In the Sitback collection, beside the edible species that we mentioned here, we have these medicinal uh, forage, species, construction, and endemic and, uh, species there. So coming back to Simi, I must tell you that I, every time I come back to Simi, I remember the tremendous proposal of this man to create the concept of green revolution, which is absolutely uh, something which is for me, a very impressive concept. And he really is fight against hunger. And as you know, these points that he used to fight against hunger. First of all, he used, of course, the high yielding varieties, the fertilizers, the pesticides, and the infrastructure that you know. And that he could increase the yields without increasing or expanding the agricultural land. But in Mexico, our president, for the first time in my lifetime, I learned that they accepted that well, the government accepted that uh, Mexico recognizes that we are really in problem, and he created the crusade against hunger. I mean, to accept that we are in crisis is something which is quite important. And beside that, he said, let's try to fight extreme poverty. So the main question is, how and with what we are going to tackle this situation. We can use, of course, sea products. I'm not going to talk about that. But we have as well land products. In the land products, what for me, I have a review. There are certain things that we are, at the moment, having in mind. One of those is precisely the Masagro proposal, which is a very interesting proposal, tremendous um, challenge, et cetera, et cetera, which is uh, everybody's expecting things from Masagro. Beside that, there is the other group, the people that think that transgenic plants 
I'm going to sort out the problem. Of course, I have a handicap of the society is going more for organic and not accepting transgenic very easily. The other group is the group that we all work for some time trying to do uh, research in cropping system and as well uh, genomic selection. But our proposal is to use the biodiversity we have in this country. Mexico has been mentioned several times, many times, that this is a rich country that has biodiversity. So the proposal we had is precisely to use what is already mentioned in the sacred books of the Maya people, at least in the tropical rainforests, to see whether they have any new or any proposal or any plant that we haven't taken off. So in the Popol book, which is the Maya Kitchen uh, sacred book, they have they mentioned 31 species from 22 botanical family. And the Chilambalam, they have 160 plant species from 60 botanical families. What the, this sacred book takes us 500 years back. What plant, which plants were used by the Maya? And then we set up in our Yermo Plus Bank in the main entrance, now the two gardens. One garden is precisely related to the plants of the Popol Blue, and the other, the garden of the Chilambala. And one of the things which for me was very important is that they decided to dedicate a piece of the book to the creation of mankind. And when we read that book, we can read in part of that book this sentence. They planned, first of all, the, cre the, the creation and the growth of trees. When, when I read this, I knew that before anything, they decided that trees were important. And so what I really uh, did was to see how many trees we have in the sacred books of the Maya. And as you can see, 60 different tree species belong to 25 botanical families. And the main families uh, of those trees are what I, it is written there. But one of the trees that really was outstanding is precisely this one called Brosimum alicastrum. Common name, Ramon. Brosimum in Greek means edible. The name was coined in 1782. And if you read the book, you come across this little paragraph. The Ramon fruit is their bread. The ramon fruit is their drink. So in both books, is written the importance of this tree. So our proposal was, OK, let's get involved into this tree. Let's see which are the, what we call the botanists, the ecosystem uh, services of this tree plant, and establish the project which is uh, written here, trying to measure and quantify all the impact in the climatic change, in food production, energy, and others of this tree. So we dedicated at least 10 years to learn about all the properties of this tree. So what I'm going to present to you are the fundamentals as to why we should consider this tree as a key plant for the fighting against hunger. So I have these five points that I want 
to show you as to why I consider this tree important nowadays. First of all, everybody in the Yucatan, in the Maya land, know the Ramon tree. And in many of the houses of the little towns, like in here, you see that they have planted trees. And those trees help for not only for feeding themselves or for climatological impact that they have because the climate is moderated with this tree, but as well because they don't make it an outspoken announcement of their trees. So you just, when you drive across the, the Maya land, you say, why do they plant so much this tree? And if you ask about the tree, everybody knows about this tree. And they use it to feed animals as well. And it's, it's extremely palatable. In the main street in Merida, you walk, and because of the service of uh, beautiful trees and climatic, you have the Ramones in there. But if you go to the tropical rainforest, one of the dominant species is precisely Rosimo malicatus. We have five million hectares of tropical rainforest, and the dominant, one of the dominant plants is this tree. And this tree is actually from uh, Tamaulipas down to Quintana Roo, or from Sinaloa down to Chiapas. It's present there. And the peasant society, they call it in many different names. And of course, it is present as well in the Central America and part of South America. One of the things which took me uh, some time was precisely the productivity of this tree. And using the same system as for olive oils, I collect the seeds and began to measure the productivity of the tree. And one of my students gave me these results, that each tree per year produces about 145 kilograms of seeds per year. Well, let's be conservative and put 100 kilograms of seeds per year, per tree. You see, when I graph this against the typical plant species of trees that we eat in the, the seeds, I notice that it's a monster. I mean, chestnuts, of if you have uh, some others like uh, olive oils or what else, they do not produce that huge amount of seeds. So if I play around with some figures, you see, the mean production of maize in Yucatan is 0.19 uh, tons per hectare per year. In Chiapas, it's about this one, 1.5 tons per hectare per year. And if I have the average maize production, it's about three tons per hectare per year. Well, with nine, with 10 trees in the Yucatan, I can get that amount of, of production. So if I have a plantation of about 200 trees per hectare, I can easily harvest in a very conservative way 20 tons per hectare. As I said, it's extremely palatable and it's been used for the last 500 years in the Maya land area. So if I want to raise 10 million tons for the livestock sector, if I have to go with maize, I will require about 4 million hectares. But if I go with Ramon, I just need half a million hectares. 
Then I came to measure the quality of the flower and the seeds of this tree. And I found that it has more than 12% protein, almost no lipids, and this about 60 or 70 percent of carbohydrates. It has a very decent amount of minerals and vitamins. I came to do the pattern of the amino acids present in the system. And as you can see, the amount of lysine is impressive. And I'm checking uh, tryptophan just to make sure that it has uh, better levels. But anyway, the pattern is this one, and as you can see, appreciate, it's quite good. So if I come to compare my Ramon seeds with, in the case of fiber, with maize, trigo, rice, or soya, you can see how is it present. If I come to proteins, Protein is higher than maize, wheat, and rice. And if I come to lipids, of course, there is almost no lipids. That's why the flower lasts very long. Because of the data I had, I sent a sample to a, a laboratory in Canada. And just to check whether my techniques were correct, and then send me back their data and confirm that our results were correct. So in the case of mineral, I noticed that the amount of potassium was incredible. The amount of calcium, the amount of, as you can see here, no? It's, it is very good one. And uh, last year I came to the meetings of CIMIT in Mexico City. And I heard about this problem of celiac disease, you see, the gluten-free food. And the celiac situation that you know all over the world is somehow a very peculiar situation now. So I sent a sample of our flour to Semit. And I have signed it, no, here. I said, there is no gluten in that flour. So what I did is all the engineering of producing the flour. I have done all that and did the packing. And I registered the Maya Osh already in the property, what else? And I put in the back these things that is required for so these are the most popular flowers in Europe. So I, my dream is one, my host might be present. Here, oh sorry, if I come to compare our Maya host with the flowers of the European uh, products, I found that the amount of fiber proteins is very high in comparison with those uh, flowers. So I felt happy that we were able to find those data and run out experiment with my colleagues about the pathogens of the tree. And always keeping in mind this, how to produce food without destruction of the environment. This is something which is very important. So my colleagues did few theses working on the pathogens using electron microscopy, etc. And so now we know that in the tropical rainforest they never have epidemic diseases. And of course the people that uh, like genes, they did this work on markers, no? To see how is the situation with our uh, collections all over the place. And I decided to measure some of the uh, things that people mentioned to me. 
is it drought resistant? And we found that this is really a drought resistant plant. And it's resistant to hurricanes. It's resistant to flooding. We measure the leaf area, and it is impressive, the leaf area. And it's a perennial plant. That's why the peasants, during the dry season, they come and collect the, the leaves to feed in their cattle. That is a fantastic trap for CO2. We have done, of course, Matthew, all the measurements with Irga. Thank you for coming, by the way. So this is the impressive leaf area you can see in this tree. So I present this data to the Mexican Academy of Science, as well as to the Foro Consultivo Científico de este país, to tell them what we have been doing the last 10 years. Because, as you know, I was the director of Centro de Botanica here at the Colegio de Postgrado at Chapingo. And they wonder, well, what are you doing over there in the tropics? So I present all of this data. And they approve that this an interesting line. And I talked to the governor of the state, Brand, and the, he opened the, the opportunity to presenting our results. And he established a political decision. He said, let's do plant Ramon to restore many of the areas we have already spoiled. And so, as you can see here in the back, our Maya Osh, no? And then, there are very kind people that they are already doing planting. And of course, my idea is might be to the intercropping, rather. Our research center pushed the establishment of a company which is called Kishu. That company is now commercializing the products of this Ramon plant. So one of the nicest things for me is precisely that we are collecting now the seeds directly for people that is in extreme poverty in the tropical rainforest. And we have collected 20 tons of seeds this year. Of course, that's the idea of why I am suggesting you to consider the possibility of incorporating the seeds of this tree to the hunger crusade, which are the qualities of the seeds which are the qualities of the flower. First of all, it's an organic product. I'm going to repeat, it's an organic product. Nobody fertilizers, no pesticides. Product of biodiversity of this country. Gluten-free. It has a high content of protein. Has low fat content, high mineral content. And it is already in our forest. We have 31 million hectares all over the world, uh, all over the Mexican area, in which the thing we have to do is to collect the seeds and collect and collect to create a new industry. So we can at least tackle the idea of importing so much uh, seeds or grains for the animal husbandry. You know? So I think that this um, result I'm sharing with you, to me, uh, has very uh, new idea of converting biodiversity and welfare of the society. So this is part of the group. I've been working with uh, in the last 
10 years, you have taxonomists, biochemists, anthropologists, etc. And I want to thank you with this beautiful photograph of one of our anatomists that is looking precisely to the ontogeny of the seeds. Well, I finish in time, uh, Brand. Thank you very much. Is there any question I may? No, the humans, they consume it as well, the seeds. They, in fact, we have a project trying at this moment to feed the people, to which is in the Chihuahua area, with the University of Ciudad Juarez. There are certain tribes who consume uh, tortillas. And so we are mixing maize with Ramon, and this the, is very good at the result so far. And the Tarahumaras are testing our approach. We are already into the problem. We are, I'm not trying, I have not much time in life to see the results. So the Tarahumaras are testing now the tortillas of uh, Ramon with uh, maize. Well, uh, I must tell you that uh, the people from Nayarit and Jalisco, uh, many years back, of course, they made coffee. Coffee after Ramon, and it's a commercial product now. Uh, so the taste, uh, the, we have a project now with the Universidad Anahuac, and the, there are two careers, one is uh, gastronomy and the other one is nutrition and they are dealing as to produce products to attend uh, desayunos escolares which mean breakfast of the children so we want to go straight to see whether we can produce something which is ch uh, like the, the children immediately and I hope this year we will finish the first uh, step in this one Okay. Fantastic and very interesting presentation. Of course, we talked about this before. Um, yeah, one, one thing that uh, you mentioned that you can get 20 tons, which is an excellent yield given zero inputs, at least from man. Um, why, why do you think that that is not possible in some of the other regions of Mexico? That wasn't quite clear to me. And the other... The other issue, you mentioned the value of forage. Could you put a, a number on that, a, a sort of sustainable forage yield, so routine pruning without, a, without detriment? Is that possible without detriment to the seed yield as well? Well, I didn't have time to present 10 years very fast, but you have that the plant is the oika. So you have masculine and feminine trees. And so the males, we can come and harvest all the, the forage. And the forage, which we have measured the quality of the forage, is really very competitive with alfalfa. And I was surprised by the tradition they have to use year by year the forage of the tree. And this is a very impressive trick because they chop off all the leaves and next year you will come and you see whoosh again 
plenty of leaves, etc., etc. So, to me, it was impressive the productivity of the tree. Second, that the tree, at least in the uh, record we have from uh, Merida, they last so far 100 years producing seeds. Joe, you don't have to go and keep on nothing. Three years, the trees are there, and they keep producing year by year that amount of seeds. So uh, it is something we, we must look at. And on the first question, I miss it. Yeah, why, why, why the high, uh, why the big range in yield, apparent uh, yield across the Republic? So high in Yucatan, no. lower in No, Nevada. I must tell you that our data are mainly from the tropical rainforest, which is mainly the Maya land area. The, the trees <coughs> develop in all the states I mentioned to you, but the productivity in those areas I haven't measured. The idea, of course, is that uh, when you come to those places, they know the tree and they name it in a very different way. They call, ah, you mean Ojoche. Mm -hmm. um, it's not Ramon, I know, we have Ojoche. And so the cultural background of this species is tremendous. And so I think that if we are uh, confident that the biodiversity is a proposal that we should consider to fight hunger, is one opportunity, and I am, I want to talk to you because we can use now something which intercropping wheat with, with Ramon. I think that could be possible or maize. And uh, anyway, sorry. Anybody else? Hello. Oh, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. I, when I was doing my PhD in Chiapas, in the Lacandon Forest, I had some experience with um, Rosimium, with Ramon, and um, we identified two challenges in relation with using Rosimium there. And perhaps I'm extrapolating, I would like to know what is your experience in Yucatan area. One of them is that Rosimium was very related. When people were talking about Rosimium, Ramon, as for food, they were basically referring that it was only when the situation was very, very, very critical that people would eat it. So they make reference that in one point, yes, there was not maize, there was nothing to eat, and that was the way that they eat from um, the seeds of, of prosimium, but that they were not really willing and the taste for them was not very interesting. So I was wondering, because I didn't see in your presentation, if you have been doing work with the Mayas from, from Yucatan, and what is their perception about eating the, the seed? Because that's something key, no? It's like, if you want to improve that area, pe the, the perception of the people of, of the food is critical. And the other thing that we found as challenge, because we were using it also for, for food pur purposes, for food banks, is that, that management, the agronomy of the tree was a challenge by itself. So I, I, I think I share with you the idea that it will be incredible that we can do intercropping of maize with brosimium as we are doing with other fruits in the MIAF system. But I found, at least in my short experience, a lot of agronomic challenge to do that. Well, thank you for asking that. I just been in the beautiful area of Montes Azules in Chiapas. And the person I talked to, they walk with me to see the Ramon tree. And this huge tree of 40 meters big and one and a half meters wide, he showed me that they are paid if they produce these logs for the trains, you see. And so they come and destroy the tropical rainforest trying to get products for their survival. 
And I mentioned to them, listen, but uh, what about the seeds? And they said, well, they are so much. We can eat it. And we are now buying the seeds in Chiapas. And they now are getting into the idea that seeds might be converted in an agro-industry. We have been mentioned to them mainly for reducing the import of grains for animal, uh, for sistemas pecuarios. Uh, uh, and so uh, the people from Chiapas, they are very aware now of our crusade of using the tree to produce uh, food. Um, just by the way, I, we are very close now with chefs of many parts trying to see whether they can prepare dishes with, with these uh, seeds. Because you can produce the flour, but you can as well eat the seeds directly. Uh, so they, you can have, you have to remove the taste and then the people do tortillas or many other things. Uh, of course, our anthropologists, they mentioned to us that there is certain degree of uh, histories behind that were pushed by the Spaniards when they came. The Spaniards brought the animals, you know, the, the, the cows, etc., etc. So they didn't have grass to feed the animals in the peninsula of Yucatan. They didn't have that. And so the name Ramon means precisely that they noticed that the cows, etc., etc., used to, you know, ramonear los árboles. That's why it is called Ramon. And so they noticed and they said, don't touch those trees for human feeding is for the cows and other feeding. So the, the people has that handicap. So we have to fight a little bit, but I hope that the, when the, the chefs and the gastronomists and the nutrition people come across good products, I'm sure that we are going to have something decent and we might produce a snack etc., etc., that might be commonly used, I hope. Well, that's it. La voy a hacer en español. A ver, doctor Alfonso, me, me gustó mucho la presentación y, y, y me llena de inquietudes en el sentido de si han hecho pruebas ya combinando ambas harinas, maíz y, y, y de semilla de ramón, si hay alguna prueba, si hay algún plan que lo quieran hacer, eh, harina de maíz se puede conservar por seis meses, no sé si, si el combinar, si esto tiene más grasa y, y, y pueda afectar un poco. ¿no? La semilla que le mostré en mi oficina es de un material, una variedad que estamos eh, impulsando en Haití, de alta calidad de proteína, tiene alto contenido de lisina, pero ya viene una nueva generación de híbridos, que no van a tener esta característica. Entonces, sí veo que pudiera ser una alternativa, entonces, mezclar cosas, ¿no? Si tenemos algo que tiene alto contenido de lisina, le tener, estaríamos con híbridos de nueva generación con alta producción de grano, pero sin embargo estaríamos atendiendo a esta gente de Haití que si lo necesita. Ellos hacen polenta, hacen otro tipo, no hacen tortillas, ¿no? Pero pudiera ser una alternativa a esa combinación de harinas. Entonces, por eso quería saber si hay alguna experiencia haciendo harinas combinadas. La, res la respuesta es sí. Eh, mis estudiantes han hecho todo tipo de platillos y hacen degustaciones. Y las degustaciones se las compartimos a los del centro de investigación para que nos den su opinión del sabor. I'm sorry, we, are, we have done several dishes uh, with my students and they have made Uh, mermelade, for instance, which is very tasty, very unique. We have made uh, cakes, and, uh, and it's very acceptable. Uh, the only thing is that uh, we've been highly criticized because 
They said, well, okay, where can I buy the flour? There is not as yet in the shelves in the market. So we are working now with this company to do as much, uh, to, to work as quick as possible to, to share the, the flower with everyone. I hope it's going to be a, a decent price, no? because this has to be competitive price. But anyway, I, I'm not working very close with this um, people because uh, I'm not very good in marketing. No. Well, thank you so much, Frank. Thank you very much to you, and I hope next time I can offer you something made of Ramon. And I'm sure to keep an eye on it, and I'm sure that you will, at least we are going to reduce the import, the, the imports of grain for the animals, at least. Thank you. Muchas gracias y gracias también por mantenerse en el tiempo y eh, muy agradecido por esta presentación. Muchas gracias. gracias